Today we're going to be looking at this Marshall JMP, last in the line, 212 combo, 2104 model. Um, I think that same year that this came out in 81, I think that was also the start of the JCM 800s. Let me know if I've got that date wrong. Um, and this little baby's sick. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, go grab yourself a coffee, grab one for me as well. I'll have a small flat white and let's get started. We can see the two 12 inch speakers. These are the original Celestia roller speakers. So hopefully they're okay, we'll test them out. Uh, but you can see the grill cloths hanging in and the cabinet has got a judicious, judicial use of gaffer tape all the way around. I have a horrible feeling if I peel that gaffer tape off, this app's gonna fall apart. But the real sad story lies at the chassis. Let's go have a look at that. Well, from this angle, it doesn't look too bad. We can see that the uh, date of the final test on this was 4th of September, 1981, making it almost 23 years old, 22 years old. But, if I angle it up this way, the true horror begins. For a start, what kind of a turkey hand writes a sticker and puts it on the front of an amplifier like this and just says serviced 16 October 2019. Uh, so three years ago, no, two years ago, this thing was allegedly serviced. Also, we can see quite a bit of rust on the transformers and, hello? <laughs> yeah, did you notice that there is only one bolt holding this transformer together? Also, we have the original capacitors ugh, from the 22nd week of, um, 1981, so obviously these are going to be the same. And he decided to leave in caps which are now 40 years old. Well, fortunately, his service work didn't seem to actually extend much to the inside of it. All of this looks very original, except that I can see, I don't know if you can see that that filter cap there, sorry, that, um, yeah, it's filter cap for the bias circuit is leaking. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, can you see that? There we go. Oh, that's heavy. It's leaking. So in addition to the main filter caps, I'll replace the two uh, bias filter caps We'll clean out that bias pot. Oh, my favorite. It looks to me like all of these potentiometers have been drenched in WD-40. That is not a proper lubricant to use on a potentiometer. Things like that, uh, WD-40, if you don't know, Never put it near an amplifier. In fact, don't even keep it in the house where an amplifier exists. Um, it's a just a, it's a dust magnet. It's a great product, it has its place, but not inside an amplifier, please. Hmm. Thanks for the coffee, by the way. Oh, Fiesta Red Cup instead of my usual surf green. Hmm. No, it's not a hint. I don't have a Fiesta Red Strat yet. Now, this is the first thing I want to look at, how the earths have been done. So we've got the earth coming in from the mains there, and I really don't like the way this is done. Um, I know it's the way Marshall do it, but I don't like it. So I will solder that mains earth, of the most important earth probably in the app, directly to the chassis. And while I'm there, I'm going to solder that directly to that same point for that filter cap there, reservoir cap there, and that one to the same point there. So at least the mains ground and the two first earth points will have a good solid ground together 
without any, because as you can see, there's going to be a probably immeasurably small, but after 40 years, I'll bet you it's there. There's going to be some resistance between that lug and the chassis, and then between the chassis and that lug to that ground point, and likewise to that ground point there. Now let's check the fuses, make sure they're right. There's our mains fuse, it should be two amp. Make sure the fuse is in good condition and it's the right value. Uh, what do we got? Two amp, yes. But you'd never trust a fuse, they lie to you. What if there's a break under there? And it looks okay on the outside. Yeah, you just, they just lie. So get your continuity checker and then you know. Okay, that one works. Okay, here's our HT fuse. So what have we got? We've got half amp, slow blow, with a big crack in it. I'm glad we checked that. Okay. Into my... Amp draw. Got him in. Now I'm just not liking this poor little output transformer just floating around here. There's only one bolt holding this thing together. I think I'm going to do a quick dash out and um, get some more bolts from my favourite bolt supplier. Might be sick. Just back from my favourite fastener supplier in Sydney called Regime, and he said, man, good luck getting a slotted cheese head um, bolt. He said if it was in England, no problem, because England is full of people and bolts. <laughs> I thought that was a great saying. Anyway, it got me ones which look the part and more importantly will do the job of keeping this transformer together. So why am I such a stickler about transformer mounting and stuff like that? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a bit loose. Well, it does. Because the heart and soul of your amplifier is these two lumps of iron. The output transformer, probably the most critical of all in my opinion, because your sound literally passes through this one. Your power transformer, sure, it has an impact on the sound, but not as directly as that. Um, by the way, this is your choke. Um, you can tell this in a couple of ways. A transformer has got a pair of windings going in and a pair of windings going out, so you'll see wires on one side and wires on the other side. Same with your power transformer, or multiple wires, because it's a center tap. But a choke has just got two wires, which I don't know if you can see, it's just got two wires here, one wire in, one wire out. A choke is just um, the old term for inductor. Oh yeah. Now we have got a, um, a reasonable budget for the work on this amp, but it is limited. And so I have to just be judicial in how I use my uh, allowed time. I would love to have enough spare time to be able to um, wire brush off this surface rust, put on some rust stabilizer, and then I might coat it with a little bit of WD-40. I know I'm being very hypocritical saying don't leave it in the workshop, but just as a um, protector of the surface that so we don't want to get corroded again. I'll see how I go with time. I'd like to do that. I'm going to solder a more secure earth point to the chassis. So I want a point that's convenient to that earth coming off the mains and the grounded um, points there for our first two filter caps. 
So I'm thinking maybe around about here. So I just need to grind away some of that protective coating. floating around in here from my afternoon snifter. Good. I'm going to just check that power transformer mounting because if these things are loose, not too bad. Okay, that one was quite loose. I don't want to get any buzz or hum. Yeah, two were a little bit loose, but not too bad really. Good to check. Let's start removing some of these earth points. I know these are discharged. But, hey, at my life stage, I doubt if I'd survive a 450 volt kick in the teeth. So these are the replacement filter caps I'll be using. They're a multi-cap can, 50 plus 50 microfarad. So there's our ground that's marked here. And uh, the ground marked here. So between here and here is 50 and between here and here is 50. And the first reservoir cap had it bridged across there, which is putting them in parallel. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. So I save my little resistor clippings because I can use them for little things like this. Perfect. I reckon if I give that little bend there. All right, so that's done, looking good. So I might just hit that with a bit of solder pen. I know there's flux in my solder, but hey, call me anal. Everyone else calls me asshole. A lot easier to do this when it's outside the amp. I'm not gonna solder that one yet because <coughs> I've got to attach the yellow wire, so I'm just going to stick him in there. However, I do need to get a bit of green wire to go not very far. Oh, I should turn on my little exhaust fan. It's not so much the lead in the solder. It's the horrible acid or whatever they use in the flux. My oh God, that's the stuff that hits you in the lungs. My big soldering iron should be well and truly hot by now. So I just want to tin and put some solder on there. I will use that. Not as fancy as some, I know. But, as you can see, it does the job. Look at that getting sucked out there. I'm very happy with that. It's nice, neat, not too big, 
but big enough. All right, I have the two new F&T filter caps in. Um, these two terminals are parallel together, giving us 100 microfarad there. And just so one, just one wire going off there. The earth wire is then soldered to the chassis, the same place where the main earth coming in from the mains is soldered, which is also where the earth point is on the second filter, reservoir cap, is soldered. Uh, it has two individual 50 microfarad taps there. Um, so next one is to see how we're going to replace the next filter cap because it's underneath the PCB. Yay, fun days. All right, I've loosened that. Oh yes, it's coming out. Okay, so this is pretty much all we've got to do. We've got enough lead in here. So we're just gonna solder the black to the ground lug and those two reds to those two there and that should just slip straight back in. We had enough slack in there and I was very careful not to trim those wires at all. So when this needs to be done again in 15 years time, the next tech will have enough slack to do that. So now I can just go back in and that's the recapping almost done. So here's the power supply. And this is the area that we're interested in here. But let me just show you how it all fits in. So here's the signal coming from the phase inverter. There's our positive and negative phases going into the grids of the two tubes. And these are the all important coupling capacitors. We've got to make sure that these aren't leaking because we want to, this is going to be very high voltage here and we want no of none, we want none of that high voltage to be appearing on this side because the grids need to be negative compared to the cathodes. So how is that, that how is that done? It is done by this little circuit here. So uh, these are R23 and 24. Traditionally they're 220k. Yeah, 220k. And the bias comes to the center of that. And we follow that around. Uh -huh. And here are, oh, here is our bias pot that we're finding right there. It looks like these capacitors are bigger than these capacitors, but in actual fact, they're not. These paralleled ones are our big F and T's that we replaced. Um, so they've been replaced. And here's that diode that is reverse biased. You'd normally expect it to be going this way if it was positive, but because it's going this way, we know that's a negative voltage. And it is smoothed by C16 and C15 before it goes to our bias adjuster and onto that uh, network there. So C15 and C16 are 10 microfarad at 100 volts. You know, I, I like to increase these values, but you can't increase them too much because a capacitor, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard the term RC network, RC, it creates a delay, a time factor. So the bigger that is, the bigger that resistor is, or the bigger this capacitor is, the slower it's going to react. So if we make these capacitors nice and big so that the bias voltage is rock solid and quiet, it's gonna take a while to get to that voltage. So, so what if it takes a while, you say? Well, remember the grid has to be negative compared to the um, cathode. If it's the same level of the cathode, i.e. zero, that tube is going to be full on, you know, 100% pedal to the metal. And it could red plate. 
and that's the problem with increasing this too big because it will slow down that ramping up. Well, won't that plate voltage be slow to ramp up as well? No, because it's going through a solid state rectifier and when that standby switch is hit on, uh, it's going to be pretty close to instant. Yeah, yes, it's got to charge these up, but it'll still be a lot faster. So we don't want to risk our tubes. So I'm going to increase it. I'll see what I've got in stock and make a decision. I've decided that I'm going to do a bit of a mixed bag. So I'm going to use a 100 microfarad cap right here where it's going to have the greatest voltage and um, it'll help to charge that up the fastest and having a much higher capacitance value will smooth that out much more than a 10 microfarad but I didn't want to use another 100 microfarad here because I didn't want to slow down the charging up of the bias so for the second capacitor I'm going to use a smaller one 8 microfarad so it's going to just provide a final level of smoothing this is going to do the bulk of it that's going to just do the final bit of it let's install these so can we use a larger capacitor for the bias than even what I've installed which is definitely larger I like large bias capacitors I'd go bigger I want them noise free I want it stable and the bigger it is the more capacity a capacitor has to remain stable if it's too small it can go up and down but aren't we going to endanger the power tubes by having a bias supply that's too slow to ramp up not if you have a standby switch and I think that's why we need to just have a closer look at the schematic as to why a standby switch is sometimes an important thing. Not always, but in this case it is. Let's have a closer look. Here's our power transformer. Uh, the secondary side, we see this full wave rectifier happening here, going through a standby and up into the center tap of the output transformer. But here's the leg that we're interested in right now for this discussion. Comes down here through a dropping resistor and a, let's call it reverse biased or backwards diode here, which means it's not going to have a positive uh, rectification. It's going to be a negatively rectified voltage with sort of like a succession of um, half wave sine waves underneath the zero volt line. So it's half wave rectified going through this smoothing capacitor here, dropping resistor, smoothing capacitor here. This actually forms a bit of a pi filter, also it could be called as. Then it goes into our bias, which as we saw before, then goes up into these pair of 220K resistors to the grids and it gives us the negative reference. But let's have a look at how the standby switch and the power switch work together. When the standby switch is open in standby mode, the power switch is turned on. The first thing that happens is the transformer gets energized. The main reservoir caps are not yet activated. So this is open, but as soon as that's closed, we have this winding here putting a 6.3 volt to our tubes, which means the tubes are starting to warm up as soon as the power switch is put on. Also, you'll see that it's on the power side of the standby switch. We have the bias circuit here already working and charging on. So even if we did have large capacitors here for C15, C16, and, and this is probably applying to most amplifiers, always good to check which side of your standby switch your main filter caps are. Sometimes they're on the other side. 
So if you delay even by a second from power on to standby into play mode, by that stage, these capacitors have charged up anyway. I guess the precaution is what if someone just flicks on both at the same time? Then that's why I have my reservations about making these too large. So if you have an amplifier with a standby switch, power on first, then some time after, it doesn't have to be long, give your filaments enough time to heat up. These will have already charged up, sorry, these will have already charged up and your bias will already be waiting at its negative voltage, then you can flick your standby into play mode. If you have a, um, a tube rectifier, that's gonna slow down the whole process anyway, in which case you probably don't even need a, um, a standby switch at all. Now, before I can give this amp a clean bill of health, I need to also check the capacitors that couple the phase inverter to the EL34s, because if they're leaking, we've got problems. So I'll show you which capacitors we're talking about and how we can test them. Here's our phase inverter. Here's our grids of our EL34s. Remember, these have to be a negative voltage. Here, we're gonna have voltage that's over 100 seemingly connected straight to it. But wait, here are our superheroes. These are coupling capacitors and their job is to block that DC from getting there. Question is, how do you test it? If they're leaking really badly, well, we're gonna see a positive voltage here, in which case we've got a major calamity. So how do I now check to see if I've got any leakage coming from there? If I put a meter on there, very high input impedance, it may not provide enough of a load to give that a reference to ground. I need to see that it is pulling the level up from ground with a light load. And so I've made this little device here. And inside here, I have a little resistive network and a little LED, which is very sensitive. It's gallium arsenide, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but something like that. It's a green LED, turns on at very low voltages, not like 2.5 volts, we're talking, you know, millivolts. So I've connected that to ground, and when I power this up, you might be able to see here, here are the two legs of the resistors that I've lifted, there and there. So now what's coming to my grids, pin three, the green wire and the orange wire, green and orange, is only what's coming off these uh, coupling caps. As I said, the tubes are out. Power on. Two forty volts on the variac. And Where's my meter? You can't see this, so you're gonna just have to believe me. On, um, where's the ground, here's the ground. On the resistors that are floating in the air, we've got, currently got minus 31.2, and, oh, hello, oh yeah, minus 30. 31.8. So I'm going to also measure these to 220Ks, make sure they're, they're still the same voltage. They should be the same voltage because they're common at that point to the bias point. So now I'm going to use my super duper leakage tester and I'm going to clip it straight onto the grid, which should be at zero. If it's positive at all, that means we've got, yep, nothing coming in on the green LED there. So this is now coming straight off the coupling caps, which means that coupling cap there is not leaking at all. Let me check this one. Likewise, that's not leaking at all. So our coupling caps are good. Excellent. All right, so now I'm gonna power down, discharge, my brand new filter caps 
and I'm going to discharge. I'm using my super duper discharging tool, which I'll show you how I did one day. Um, so this one clips to ground because I keep forgetting to unplug it and I'm sick of replacing my 100 ohm resistor in here. I've got a fuse in there that blows, but of course, now that I've put a fuse in there, I never forget to unclip it. So I'll now put this on that first reservoir cap. And that will be discharging pretty fast. Already it's down to 0.4 of a volt. And while it's discharging away, I'm just gonna measure these two carbon resistors here that should be 220k just set up my meter which you're not going to be able to see I don't think first one is 233 kilo ohms 233 and this one is 226 Two three two divided by two two six. Uh, they're only three percent apart. We did notice a slight difference in bias voltage. Look, everything else is so original. It's in it's in the tolerance. So, despite my better judgment of having everything perfect, I'm going to leave those as they are. I'll pop those back in, knowing that these two coupling caps are now okay. The customer fault report always gives you a good clue as to where you should be looking. See that first item? Cutting out occasionally on the high input. Let's have a look and see if we can figure out why that is so. So I found this other schematic for the JCM800, which is identical to the 2104, in fact it even says so here. So these were out uh, concurrently. And I like this, it's a little bit clearer. So if we just look at the low input signal, so when there is nothing plugged into either one, this little contact here and here grounds out those inputs, make sure there's no noise. When we plug a guitar in, that lifts up, that contact there opens up and now a signal the low signal path goes here into this uh, potential divider network here half of which is a volume control now we know this is going to sound like shit because you know how small a guitar signal is you know you're talking millivolts to measure it you know 100 200 300 millivolts so here we're dividing it even smaller before we feed into the next gain stage, the first gain stage for the low input. So that's why it's always going to sound like crap. I don't know that many people would use the low input, but that's why it sounds like crap. So now let's look at the high input stage. When we plug in, that's no longer grounded out there, and the signal path goes through this grid stopper of 68K, pretty stock sort of value into the grid of this first gain stage here and the amplifier's signal, you know, significantly amplified signal comes up here. Oh, and look what happens here. It goes through this coupling cap, so there'll be no DC there, and then connects to our low input jack. So we've now got a signal which is significantly larger than the low input already amplified going in here now it goes into the volume control and into the next gain stage this is why this is going to sound so much more dynamic and um, pleasing pleasing to the ear excuse me however there is a weak link and the weak link is a clue that the customer gave us he said cutting out occasionally on high input because when we have the high input, it has to go through this contact here. And this contact here is inside the input jack. And if there is any crap, muck from dirty leads, from <coughs> WD-40, anything that's going to inhibit that contact being perfect 
is going to cause intermittent noise, cutting out, etc. So I am very confident, 90% confident that this is where our fault lies. Then that goes on through here and through the circuit. But I'm going to pull these out and um, so we can clean them properly. It's just too hard to clean it there. And if we can't clean it, especially the low, I'm going to replace it. But hopefully I can clean that up. I pulled those sockets out and there was certainly some crap in there. I've made myself a little collection of files that I use to clean the contacts of various types of sockets. This one is a commercially available one. That one is, uh, I use that for the switchcraft type of connector, 12A type of connector. Here's one that I made out of a nail file, so it's really fine and I just ground it down so that it'd fit in the much tighter spacing of a cliff jack. And sometimes they're just in a weird ass angle and um, I just found a right angle something or other and I ground that down to a point and um, I've got a flat face to it which is pretty much just the polished um, steel size. And they do the job just fine. You don't want it too abrasive because they've got like a protective coating on it. You just want it to be able to knock off any crap that's on there. And then I spray it out with contact cleaner. And um, like as we mentioned before, no one's going to use the low input jack. So I've put in there some um, deoxid, which will just help it not corrode in the years to come. I've been cleaning all the pots, including the bias pot. So um, I'm not sure where to put that bias pot. Uh, on the drawing, it's implying about minus 30, but we're going to start by running it at the coldest possible setting. So now I'm going to put in the tubes and we'll continue on with our analysis. I've now got a full complement of tubes in there. I've had to replace one of the preamp tubes that had a crack in it. And um, so I've got my bias probes in series with the power tubes. I've got my bias probe installed, uh, one for each tube, and that's going to be measuring the plate voltage and the plate current. And if I move my bald head out of the way, you're going to be seeing the bias voltage on um, pin 5. So you can see the plate voltage there is 382. Current is starting to increase as the tubes warm up. Our bias voltage has reached its maximum value. 37 and 40. Let me just do a calc on that highest one. So we've got uh, mm, 0.04, geez, that's moving around a bit, 0.042 times 366, 15 watts, these are 25 watt tubes, about 60%. Okay, that's not too bad. I'm now going to switch those two tubes around and see if the if this is the best position for them or if the uh, if we swap them around, will the differences in the tube complement the differences in the bias voltage and see if we can bring that a little bit closer. At the moment, we're looking at around about 39 and 44. Well, I think that's the better match. So we're going to stay with the tubes in that position. I'm now going to put in a sine wave at 440 hertz, which is an A. Well, I think that'll be around about the fifth fret on the high E string. 
if I go like one kilohertz, which is what a lot of people do, you're ending up, you know, sort of so high a note that a guitar player does not typically play around there. So I'm getting something a bit more typical about what a guitar player is likely to do. Here's our, oh, look at how much lower the low input is. Still, if you're willing to sort of go to 10, it peaks at 10, maximum volume 10 on the low input. This is going to look like some ugly square wave. There it is, with some ringing and all. This, with master volume on full, this is reaching maximum volume on knob position two. So everything after that is just various shades of distortion. Well, I've got to say this thing sounds awesome. Had a look at the customer's notes again. Squealing in high volume. So put it on full volume. And sure enough, it was squealing. So I had one preamp tube that had cracked. It had to go, well, there was a crack in it. So it would have broken very soon. Other one was squealing, that was V2. So replaced that as well, so it's two preamp tubes. Then I was playing it and I was hearing this, it wasn't in the fault report, but I was hearing a, uh, like a ghost note. And I thought, is that real? Am I imagining things? So I did what's called an FFT, a fast Fourier transform on it. And I wasn't hearing things, it was there. Um, you could clearly see, I was just focusing on a high E, about 330 Hz, uh, open E string, high E string. And sure enough, there was harmonics at 330, 660 going upwards. So it was definitely adding extra harmonics on a sine wave, which it shouldn't do at all. So I had no choice. I, re I had to replace all three preamp tubes. That was coming from the phase inverter. Bit of a weird ass one. So it's not going to be quite as cheap as I thought. But right now I just want to clean this up. Um, I took off that stupid badge there. Uh, I just want to tidy it up a bit. So I'll pull the knobs off so I can get behind there. There's all sorts of decades of gunge there. So I just got to be careful not to ruin any of the lettering. I think we're done. Let's have a quick recap. Um, got the clamp here. The, the front panel is just sort of pulled away. So I'm just gluing that back in. Okay, so first thing we did is test the EL84s. They were both okay and left in service. Sadly, all three preamp tubes had to go um, for various reasons. Microphonic, this weird ghosting thing, and a crack in uh, V1. Then um, all these multi-section capacitors, the three of them, two there and one underneath the PCB, they had to get replaced. Um, 42 years old, we're just playing Russian roulette to live them any longer. So that's gone. I also improved the, the, the quality and security of that first earth point coming in off the mains plug. And I also tied the earths from the first two filter stages to that same point, which is just, you know, gonna make for a quieter amp, not to mention safety improvements. I replaced the um, leaking bias capacitors. Um, I decided to go for a larger capacitor in one and just a slightly smaller one, eight microfarad instead of 10 on one. But that first one, um, I wanted to just give it some good heft to filter out the noise and the ripple because that's only a half wave rectifier. Um, cleaned out all of the pots, got rid of all of the WD-40 as much as I could, get rid of the WD-40 on the pots. Uh, same thing for the uh, bias pot. Um, a problem area I am sure um, is uh, with these JCM 800s and this series here where they run the high gain uh, stage, it goes through the first gain stage, loops it back into the low input jack and then on, so it picks up another gain stage. Um, but if that is not scrupulously clean, especially the low one, um, you're going to have 
problems of dropout and crappy sound. So took, removed those, gave them a really good clean. I think they've come up okay. Uh, if the owner complains about it still cutting out, then there'll be nothing for it but to change it. But I'm very conservative when it comes to changing things. I like to keep things as original as I can, unless they're consumable items, you know, like capacitors and tubes are consumable items. Uh, cleaned all the tube sockets, you know, where the little pins go in, gave them, them a good scrubbing with um, my various little brushes. Oh yeah, I tested all of the resistors to make sure that they were still, you know, within 10%. I think one or two was sort of nudging over 10%, but I left it in anyway. So I didn't have to change any of the resistors. Someone had changed one there. Um, it's still spot on. So I left all that in. These two capacitors here, probably the most important coupling caps. They have to block the DC that's on the phase inverter, which is like hundreds and 180 volts or 200 volts, something like that. Um, you can't let that get to the biasing um, pins of the EL34s or you'll cook them. So I lifted the legs of one of the, of both resistors to disconnect it from the bias supply and um, was able to confirm with my little leakage tester that um, there's no leakage there, which is great news. And I was able to keep the original capacitors there. Um, then finally, I biased the amp. Um, I set the bias to full, fully cold. Then I put in a signal into the amp. I use 440 hertz as opposed to one kilohertz. And I just keep increasing the volume uh, with maximum clean settings. So master on full and preamp volume going up slowly until I hit crossover distortion. And crossover distortion is where it had that little notch in the center at the zero point. And that is where one tube is turning off before the other tube is turned on. So that sounds pretty nasty. No one likes crossover distortion. So class AB, which is what all these main fixed bias amps are, is where one tube is going to do all of the positive and then also overlap a little bit with the other side of the signal. So it gives a chance for the other side of the tube, the other tube to get up to speed and do its half of things. So there's a little, a little bit of an overlap of that handover instead of you never want them to stop short. So I go to that crossover, the bias, uh, coldest distortion, and I just slowly warm up the bias until I see no crossover distortion. Then I go back to measure the current. In this case, I think it was about 65% from memory, which is pretty much the Goldilocks value. And um, so that's where it was. I cleaned the front panel um, as best I could. When an amp is this old, that lettering becomes very fragile. So I found um, cleaning it, you can't use anything. Yeah, you can't use um, uh, metho, methyl -ed spirits, naphtha, nothing like that. It'll take the lettering off. I use just plain water, maybe a little bit of dishwashing liquid. And I also use these cleaning wipes. They sort of have like these little tissue elements that you can pull out. Is it perfect? Nope, not even close to perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was. And um, you can see that, um, you know, there's still some smudgy bits around there, definitely around where the letters and the lines are. Uh, I just wasn't willing to risk ruining this 40 year old front panel. But now I'm gonna start reassembling it because I'm really keen to hear how this thing performs. Have a look at this beautiful pair. Oh yeah, two original Roller Celestians G1265s. Yes, the box looks like it's been dragged behind a truck, but it's original and I reckon it's gonna sound awesome. Now to reassemble it. It's a bit of an unusual mounting method for the chassis on this. This back panel goes here and the control panel is there. 
So the chassis actually mounts onto this back plate, which then goes in there. A little bit, a little bit Vox-like. I've seen Voxes like that. Um, now, in terms of the rust, I've run totally out of budget, so you know I'm now eating up my own um, time. So I didn't grind that rust off as I would have liked to have done, but I put some rust stopper on it and brushed it with WD-40, which will stop it from getting any worse. I've put the Marshall 2104 back together. Uh, I made a slight change at the end. I had second thoughts about the bias caps, so I knocked them back a bit. Um, so I've now got 22 plus 22 microfarad. Um, I was just getting a bit of second thoughts about uh, will the user always remember to leave the standby on for a few seconds? So I thought, now nah, play it safe. Go 20 and 20. It's still double the original capacitance, so I'm happy with that. Um, I measured the power output of this. It's measured, because it's got a lower plate voltage, yeah, it's got about, I think, 370 volts on the plate, 365 volts on the plate. Uh, compared to like a JCM 100 which is well over 400 volts so consequently the output is not going to be as high but it's a much more practical I think I measured it at about 38 and a half call it 40 watts which is still plenty loud as we'll probably see on that meter now I've got it on uh, volume on uh, six and master volume on two. Oh, let's, let's kick it up to three. And my tone controls are all at noon. I'm playing my Les Paul Custom called Doug in honor of um, one of my favorite, well, probably my first guitar hero um, was a guy called Doug Ford from an Australian band called The Master's Apprentices. Not much video of it, of them, because this was sort of like 1970, 71, but do yourself a favour, YouTube, Doug Ford, Master's Apprentices, and you'll see why, you know, I was just in awe of this guy. The band that I most associate with this Marshall 2104 is Thin Lizzy, Scott Gorham. So um, I only know one bit of a Thin Lizzy song, so I play that. Big apologies to you, Scott. <laughs> Thanks for dropping in. If you like that video, could you do me a favor? Give it a like, write a comment. I answer every single comment that people make. And uh, if you haven't already subscribed, you know what to do. And um, I look forward to seeing you at the next video. Thanks for coming in.